Upocrates, or on the right reason for silence. By Hippolytus of the Hills, or Upocrates five director silent erotione octor Hippolytus Acolibus. The last hero. George Frederick. Marchioni Badensi. And Hochbergens. Landgravio Svenbergens. Master. In Rotellen and Baden Viola and C. In the beginning to the greatest things, born happiness, p. It has often happened to me to be amazed at the most eloquent prince, when innumerable places, when they were perplexed about the art of speaking, he taught the wise and prudent men, with great pride, and the mules were lucubrated by the vigils, we see men of the race every day, many times sinning, tried to betray the commandments. It benefits the wealthy as well as the rich and if he neglects it, it will harm both children and the elderly. I would have feared most of them from the difficulty of the matter, in which man I discerned above all in genius, and gained by trial, and by long meditation and exercise, having acquired the faculty of speaking and of keeping silent, requires, which he by no means repents of. For it is not I who, who dare to arrogate this office to me, he was evidently disappointed in them so that work and study have put something in him, as to what of this argument, to a certain man. Myself, once I remember hearing. I would send a letter, and that in a few hours, in which intervals I usually dispose of literary leisure, no one condemns. Thus no part of life perishes, goes to study, and the mind, on the other hand, either imposes care on the people, or the leisure of the muses, unless, perhaps, some form of writing, as too familiar, and from that noble old man's most wise manner of speaking, he wants to blame someone else, but what fault there is, so far as to deplore it, in order to show that I have studied my style, lest, overflowing with excessive abundance, he should strangle the crops. The thing itself refuses to be decorated, but content to be taught. Whatever it is, in honor of you, the most eminent prince, dedicated to your name, it goes out into the public eye. However, by this letter, I would rather receive the favor than give it, I will understand easily. For you do not need the reading of these books, but the impulse of the glory of your virtues, I have long been inclined to it. Then, or especially after the conversations which he had with me two years before his death, Rudolphus Barrow Salisius, a man of generalship and illustrious in military praise, the memory of which is sacred to me, he had of you. I heard more than once that he said, as he was of sharp judgment, that he had power in you, greatness of mind, ability to speak, and the gravity of the sentences, to be greatly admired, with this addition, don't doubt yourself, but if at any time it should happen that you gain a more open field by the exercise of virtue, of the great prince, Togo and Sago, you are going to fill in the numbers. I do not dwell on your praises, lest, by telling them to you, I should appear to burden your shame. Me of course, besides these, and there are others by which they draw to you, that is, your brothers, of the most prudent and excellent prince, and your merits in me, with which I am pleased to remember, and to be worshipped with constant diligence, when I understand the greatest and best God give life, I will not suffer to be covered with silence. In the meantime it will be yours, which is your highest humanity, the interest of my soul, day, that in this matter, although, it is very large, after the example of the great kings, to comfort the good ones, to whom it is often more acceptable, a vine-dressed garden, and a small barn, and a humble cottage, where the spirit is excellent, which was offered by her husband the prince, though a precious jewel. I vow it with my whole breast, and now I do not know what I feel, because the mysterious throbbing of my heart commands me to despair. Goodbye, happy prince writes. The 10th of November 1603. TV, A. Celsite Dini. Most Addicted. Hippolytus of the Hills. Hario. Arpocrates. Or, On the Correct Reason of Silence. It is now the 10th year, and the 8th, when, seeking Risha on business, having passed over the Alps, near Cloena, that neighboring town of Italy, I fell in with my father's friend, once, even when they were both engaged in Caesar's court, a man in all his life of exemplary character, and especially adorned with arts worthy of that nobility. Toward the river he strode, on the falling day, 
the silvery waves of which he knew, and he went on, happily fleeing the grass. Are you looking for a name? He likes to call Pomponium, for Atticus lived very much like him, in fact elegant, not magnificent, splendid, not sumptuous, he affected everything with care and cleanliness. Liberal towards men of all kinds, especially the learned, he had far from sadness and arrogance, so however, that Tacitus, his father-in-law Agricola, either facilitated his authority, or lessened his love, and it was difficult to understand whether his friends feared or loved him more. At this, I say, Pomponius, having embraced me from the fire, indeed embraced me very lovingly, for I had already sprung to my feet, at the first instant meeting, so he seized me. Happy is this my walk, which has won me so much a guest, to whom I, it would be a crime, my father, not to have seen you, to set foot in this place. No, says he, or have passed this way, and have not spoken in ours. Disputes, I say, O nobles O thief Erebog, you are satisfied. Smiling at this, so sober to suit. Did you miss that marshal? Ah, miserable and insane, he has been quarreling for twenty years anyone, when you beat Gargillian okay. But I love all these, which, if no other, will certainly bear this fruit, because you have interceded with me, I told the boy and my wife that we would dine in the garden. Then I, I seem to hear someone else. For the lady heard the alarming mention, he will immediately point out the dishes with which you would like to arrange the dinner, but let us be frugal, I beseech you, my father you know that Seneca nothing more scandalous than a sumptuous dinner. And your conversations alone surpass all the pleasures of Tarentine and Sicily. Let us be frugal, says Pomponius, with a calmer face, I am planting a dinner in the garden, that is, plain earth and unbought dais, you know that a garden is a poor man's storehouse. I always liked that of the younger African, who, as long as he lived, bought nothing, sold nothing, built nothing, although I could not imitate him in any of these. While we alternated between these and other discourses, we arrived at the house of Pomponii, a large Hercules, and so constructed that nothing was wanting in it, either for the duties of the household, or for the dignity of adornment. He showed me the room, filled with various pictures, in which he had ordered my parcels to be stored, and after he had said, you have my boys, while yours take care of the horses, order, order, the spa gave me the powder to shake off the travelogue. But not long after he had returned, the cell, he said, is waiting for you. You are too much for me, my father, I follow, but he led me to the right into the gardens, joined to the houses, adorned with various topiaries, to which he had access from the inner chambers. It is to be seen there that the roads go round the whole place, intersecting the middle in various ways, and affording pleasant walks. How useful is Cerna's excellent crested boxes! What soft meadows grow around! This bright spring leaps forth, Hydra, and pours its plentiful waters, from its throat above seven times. The lymph gives soothing sounds, and the falling heavens welcome the Parian marble vessels of the lake. When I had scanned these things with my first eye, and had saluted my mother fam, a Bayua, adding to those things which are usually said at the first meeting of the guests, I lead the porch under the shade, there everything is prepared for dinner, how we absolve the achromatic quintessence of various kinds of talk, most of them pleasant. And when the water had already been given to the hands, and the messenger removed, Pomponius turned to me, do you want us to walk a little while? Said he, or should we rather rest in this seat covered with grass? To stand at dinner or to walk softly and slowly, doctors teach, let us see, I say, your gardens, before the day turns into night. So we got up, while I gaze with a curious eye on the wonderful variety of Indian trees and flowers. For there is no tree that is either pleasing to the eyes or fruitful. How not to put these places art suffers? Of yours, my father, I say, the same can be said of Caesar's garden, that Spaniard, by new force, Caesar gives you the Nilotic land pitiful, the ambitious Hibernians, the sailors mock the gardens of Pharos the Memphite. He entered the first threshold of the garden. It is a crime to have taken your cares here. Cares fleeting and restless, and more painful diseases. 
Pomponius laughs at these things, I will confess to you, my son, that I will tell you with great diligence and expense, to have collected these exotic plants and trees, and I enjoy them with so much pleasure, for it is not surprising that Diocletian put the scepter in the garden. Atilius, who changed the ploughs into bundles, and in the midst, says Symmachus, of the seed bed, the peasant magistrates set up the panting oxen. Cicero is oft in my mind, who used to say that from the word he was as if from bonds, the country was to rejoice. Doctor, every chorus loves the forest and flees the cities. Besides the rest, do you not think that I can write poems in Rome, amid so many cares and so many labors? Here he calls the bridegroom, here he hears the writings, leaving them to all the servants, he lies here on the hill of Quirinus, at this end in Aventine, both are to be seen. And do you think that the most noble families of the Romans, in frustration, have transferred the name of the country life to their descendants as titles of honor? Fabians, Lentuli, Pissos, Serranos, Agricolas, Lactucini, Stelloni, Rustici, and others, like Cicero and Sepi. With them you rest secure, and life does not know how to deceive, the gods of various riches, in these broad leisure fields, the cave, the lake, in these cold weather, and the oxen mood, and slept softly under the tree. They are not far from the forest and the fields, and the patient of works, little, accustomed to the young man. Holy God the Holy Fathers, the ends threw them in his desire to leave the land, he made his footsteps. I to these, I pray that your speech may be paused, my father. Indeed, you pursue me with too much desire for this rustic life, and indeed I am a fool. Those towers of kings and great thresholds I pursue with the mighty one. How much better it would have been, bought as a lamb, to live in the most inglorious secrets of the skies, we have heard and seen many times that they were crushed. Augustus Caesar, to whom they report that many of the villi were successful, he did not cease to pray for rest for himself, and a vacation from the Republic. To ask, identically, he repeated, that he would one day live for himself. Happy is that peasant who rejoices with the setting sun, ending the heat of labors and cares, he takes vegetables and meat with his own, indeed, he is not an educated architect of the palate, but a con man of hunger, as the king of kings does not take the gentlest, the mountains, forests, and seas are surveyed in order to build a table. World under the poorhouse dinner without purple curtains anxious to unfold the front, he who seeks the high, seems to be seeking evil. Who cares for great wealth? The chest is not filled with treasures or gold, they do not lose heart, cares and religions, the mountains of the Persians, not the courts of long-lived Crassus. Pomponius moves his head, according to the manner of the deniers, says this young man's impetuousness, nor his son's, let him take his fill of honors, nay nauseously, refrain from being rustic, he will not understand the goods of this life, he who does not know the evils of others, hates them. While the mind fluctuates disturbed by the smoke of the court, says Seneca, it is proper for a mother to suffer nothing for long, and to change it as a remedy, do not taste this life, nor was it given to anyone to imitate for Cius Cerulius. Now while you are listening to these things, you have a pleasant life and a soft heart, lest you be pleased with any business, but not long after, there was a much greater danger to be feared. I also saw a very wise man, gay in the village, and pleasant, sad, I saw them busy in the middle of the wilderness, to whom not the Sicilians did not prepare the taste of the poison, not the song of birds and lyres, they brought back the dream. Indeed, I must admit, the life of a citizen, especially the court, is full of dissensions, quarrels, and contentions, to this end, objects of enmity, reproach, and slander, but when did you embrace the cam, and so your things and your affairs thus prepared? That you cannot go back, of your own accord, through it, like a door, to pass into that quiet, private port of the sea, be sure never to simply indulge your fortune. Lift up, lift up your eyes, to the excellent rewards of honor and magnitude. Go on, I will work hard, for the price of beauty, let no one break the effort, applauding you for pleasure. Demetrius calls a safe life, and without any incursions of fortune, the Dead Sea.
Seneca says that you have nothing to which you are excited, to which you stir yourself up, by the denunciation and attack of which you are trying the firmness of your mind, but to lie undisturbed at leisure is not tranquility, it is a curse. A little buried in inertness, hidden power I am sighing at these things, I say, Pomponius, these your admonitions are excellent, if I had been protected by those protections of nature and fortune, I should have been able to run through this stage with that success, as of old, when I fought in Caesar's court. I have heard from my father more than once that you represented the prudence, which I had acquired only through prolonged observation, years ago. At the time when you first wore it, it was pure. To this end, in conducting business and conciliating the will of men, you were very happy. It is true that we have entered upon this discourse, I beseech you, it is clear to me, Father, I say, and in old age, and with a great abundance of honours, when the greater part of thy life, in the Republic, having completed the administration, thus also many, and having completed many embassages, from thence you have become excellent in human affairs, for if you consider that what I have begun to pursue, the right way to persist, and from which barriers and obstacles to avoid, teach me and direct me. I can scarcely add anything more agreeable and useful, at this time, to me, indeed I am. As soon as the great ship was caught in the raging wind of the sea, or like a feathered bird which has not yet learned to lay in its nest. In the country of the Thebans I grew up, born under the air. To these Pomponius, why do you, says he, for your singular, and to me already proud insight of benevolence, you always speak highly of me, but now you give me a blush. With these too many praises, which I did not deserve, but your mere open love expressed in me. For the rest, be careful, what you know is excellent, nor will any one bear such obstinacy, the causes of which, at the beginning of progress, may not come to bear many things, some even against the genius usurped, don't you bring bees. Nor will you be bound by honey. The rocks are difficult, I do not deny, but those who shun judgment or mediation, especially to him, who is able to accommodate himself to the various talents and studies of men. But I will warn you of the most important things, I am not the son who deserves your expectation to earn what I am worth. Nevertheless, when you act with me as an ex-singraph, it is better to betray my ignorance by acting in a manner than by denying it, to seem a little friend. And since he who is a matchmaker seeks to emerge in the halls of great princes, two things are to be noted, what should be observed towards the prince and what towards the rest. Whether they be superior, or equal, or inferior, before I pursue these things one by one, it is necessary to lay the foundation of the language of prudence. By which, not having been placed straight, whatever you build upon it will fall, even in the least, but by tomorrow's light, indeed, Mercury, the ruler of sleep, is already calling us, you are especially, my dear, exhausted, no doubt, and languishing on the road. Now their shepherds have put their flocks in stables, you are already asleep, the black night silence of the earth. It begins. From the page I say sleep, while we must have these, we live for several hours, it is Ariston's eloquence, a very short period of life allotted to man, because sleep is like a publican, it would take half away, if I were to sleep, I would wish to fall asleep to your words as if to the sweetest harmony. The voice of all harmony is sweeter than that of an emoticon. But you must have reason, let us go. So, returning home by the steps, he, resisting me, went to the bed of the company, and prayed for a good night, and retired. I, however, rested gently at the borders of the light. At night, when from the equanimity rose the middle roses among the blue flames, I emerged from a lively sleep and went to bed, the recollection of the conversation of the evening invaded my mind at once, and I was eager to know those things which Pomponius had liberally promised, having worshipped that eternal God with the Christian rite, I asked for his shelter, but having warned the boys that they were already in the garden, I found them walking from the trail, and greeted them. He who returns to safety, says to the wayfarers, this is the custom, to wake up early, but with me, that is to say, my son, you ought to have rested. I have indeed rested, I say, very well, and what is more pleasing to me than all rest, I am waiting to hear you fulfill the promise my father made. 
Pomponius with a lively forehead, rigid, says the drivers. Arcadian with your eyes, however, I do not want to be a remnant of yesterday, I love you too much more. And when we were seated, it began to be done in this way. In the life of a citizen, nothing, in the opinion of the wisest men, is greater or more illustrious, than to speak well and ornately about each and every thing, but in my opinion it is no less a praise to be well silent. This, he asked, we have from God, we learn it from men. Who doubts that prudence of keeping silent is from that genus of virtues, which is in charge of governing the movements of the mind, and is the guardian of human life, he hears. No house, no doors, no words, no gates, unless there are guardians who know how to close the gates in time and to open them. Likewise, language is of no use unless you have the art of closing and opening the mouth, that is, unless you know what to emphasize and what to withhold. Not far, once upon a time, from Minerua, but in the temple of the Lupia, the Romans performed rites to the goddess Angerona. As the Egyptian Arpocrates, the Greek Sigalian, here God was depicted as all-eyed, all-gilded, half-clothed with wolf skins, wearing a cap in the manner of the Laconians, clothed in woolen slippers, his mouth bound and sealed, he who did not plead with him was forbidden the altar of prudence. For no one is wise who does not know how to keep silent. When Democritus was asked in the frequent councils, was he silent because of stupidity or lack of words? But the fool, he answered, cannot be silent. How many thousands of examples could be cited of those to whom the tongue brought destruction? How many people do you think? Did the words come back down your throat? I cut off the languages of Eretius and Aristomene Imp. Valentinianus ordered that they should be said to have brought forth only certain things which were malicious. I omit Staterius the Romans, Pausanius the Lacedaemonian, and others, as many as possible, who at least should be exhorted to silence, if they do not force, they are strong. And of course, if the brutes also consult for their own safety by silence, how much more should men, by reason of the leader, observe this? The sea breeds fleeing to the east because of the excessive heat, and flying towards the western plateau, when they begin to penetrate the mountain of Taurus, abounding with eagles against his most powerful enemies, to close the mouths with pebbles, lest even extreme necessity should provoke them to cry out, that is to say destruction, but having passed over these hills with swift flight, shake off the stones, and thus proceed safely. Oh that those who live in the courts of the prince will seriously think about it, to hide himself in the mountain of Taurus, that is to say, of those who were lying in wait, who were calling back every word of the treachery. The enemy is here, on the right-hand side, to be feared, even so, it scares the bad either way. Almonds, because they are the first of all species to bloom, are usually destroyed by frost, thus courtiers are often rash in their tongues, and their speech is impetuous, what many. Among so many and so many different errors of those who live rashly and unconsultingly, none is nearly so great as that we do not know how to keep silent at the proper time. When Pomponius had said these things, he relented a little, but I, I understand these things, said my father, that a prudent silence avails nothing, but to set aside the time to speak in silence, this work, this labor. Pomponius, smiling at a few, said, I will arrange it for you. Socrates mentions two times of speaking, or about which you know a great deal very clearly, or of which it is necessary to say, in other matters he decides to remain silent. He refuses to be silent, or if it is better to speak, he is silent. Do you have anything to catch? Not yet, therefore, unless the right reason for silence is from that kind of prudence, which, at length, while we are engaged in the custom of men, we acquire, right or just said, facts noting ours and others, what about that, the lapse of so many years, to observe, to learn to understand, as if these were certain norms. In the future I could. I will do, says Pomponius, what you wish, not so much to perform what is required by confidence, as by the shame of denying it. This is weird, so it went. He who restrains his tongue is not said to be silent prudently, but he who knows how to control all his gestures and actions. There I am, the paradox that you speak, my father, 
as if the tongue were not the only instrument of speech. Pomponius continuing the conversation, just make up your mind, he says, not just understand what I said. But, and this in addition, by keeping silent we often speak plainly. For it is certain, first of all, that the secrets of the soul of a man are often opened by exposure to the external senses, that is, the countenance, the movement of the body, the gesture, and the rest of the conformation of the body, I add colors, writing, pictures and such, he often has a silent voice and a face. Do you see me? Says the satiric, I do not know the auguries, nor the heaven of the mathematicians why I am used to them, yet from the countenances of men, I gather manners, and when I see patient, I know what he is thinking. Let him appear in the middle, that Lucian, who, before Demetrius, committed adultery with Venus and Mars. The Vulcan, warned by the sun to both of them, lays in wait, those engineers entwined with schemes, attending the spectacle of the gods, Venus was tinged with a blush, more timidly imploring the god of war, any story contains water, with only the movement and gesture of the body, but with so much clarity, so much graceful grace, as Demetrius would exclaim, I hear what you do, and I do not see, but you seem to speak to me with your very hands. I read a similar thing of Nero's mime, that Regulus, that Greek, pleaded with him for no other cause than that of his neighboring barbarians. With whom he could not communicate by speech, he could speak by gestures. Head bowed in humility, supine arrogance, leaning on the side, languor, fierce and stiff, it marks the seriousness. To see Marius, when he was in the prison of Minturnus, a certain Simba, in order to kill him, being let in alone by the sight of a greater man, so terrified as to be infected, he was compelled to turn back his foot. A nod also declares our will, and is in the mute for speech. Werner ministers to the nods of Herils. A greeting, of course, is often understood without a voice, effects and from the face, entering, the attitude of the mind is often seen. The joy of flattery is detected from the eyes and other signs of the body. Catullus wanted to be a sign of an angry man, and one who threatened someone, to lift his eyebrows. To this belongs that satiric you caper at fronte and conciliate. Why do you look at me with a frown on your face, Cato's? Nero, when promiscuously the best of all, he would take the middle, Pitus of Thrace, objected to the three bulls and the face of the teacher, lest he should be said to be violent in football without cause. To support the head with both hands, denotes sadness, therefore M. Antonius was defeated by Augustus, when Cleopatra had taken him into the ship, they write that he immediately passed to the prow, and there for some time remained silent and thoughtful, holding his head in both hands. It is also indicated by the hand of the silent people. And he pointed with his hand, and with a calm and silent countenance. Tiberius and Gracchus, when he commended his safety to the people, he brought his hand to his head. A show of hands also indicates agreement. To give a hand to the unserious to be kissed, of benevolence, to take another's hand to kiss, of humility, to have touched the prince's hand, once a sign of security, part of my peace will be to have touched the right hand of the tyrant. The gesture of kneeling and feet in prayers, both civil and religious, is very ancient. The ancients, desiring to pray for something, embraced their knees, thinking that in them was a god, and a seat of mercy, which custom is common among some today, denotes humility. He who worships, standing, as if he had already obtained forgiveness, gives thanks. A low beard and low hair, that is, if one does not cut his hair, was once a sign of sorrow and mourning. Seneca said, with my beard lowered, I came to you dirty. When Julius Caesar heard of the Tichurian defeat, he put down his beard and hair, and he did not let it down before he had claimed it. At the slaughter of Quintilius Varus, Augustus, appalled at the sight of his beard and hair bowed down his head, sometimes flashed through the doors. Look at the hair that has fallen down, in mourning fashion. For the same reason to cast down the eyes. Shame means more than a little. In Euripides, Hecuba does not dare to look at Polymnestor out of shame, I was ashamed to see her in such a calamitous state of affairs, by him whom she had once seen flourishing. The Romans, 
sent under the yoke of the Samnites to the forks of the Cordinas, though allied to the Camponus, they were kindly received, having entered Capua under night, lowering their eyes from shame and wrath. It is also a sign of shame, to cover a part of the body that is not usually exposed. Caesar could not even be deterred by three and twenty wounds, without obeying his shame, if indeed he let down each toga with his hand, that is, the lower part of the body, the roof would collapse. In this way Valerius adds, men do not expire, but dead immortals return to their seats. To toss and turn the head, to turn it this way and that, is that of the furious, or those who are enraged by the bacchanals, represent them with too much joy. With flowing hair she shook the thiasus, says Tacitus, and next to Cilius bound with ivy, to wear boots, to shave his head. Thumbs when we press the throat. We are also commanded by a proverb. They are truly disgusting, to hiss, to explode, to make a noise, to break, to burst. The Dardanides, together, roared together. Perhaps for a longer time than is appropriate, I will dwell on these colors, however, the mention of which has been made. Something to be added, for glasses, we declare the affections of our soul. Red sandals were dedicated to weddings and not only in luxury, but with yellow shoes. White is an indication of purity of soul, black for mourners, purple and red shoes for those who command, among the Romans there was a standard of cerulean color, which when raised, and in the fortified citadel, it was determined by fate, that the soldiers should suddenly fall so that in a precipitous matter, it is necessary to expediency, not by a just selection, but by a tumultuous hand. He writes that the torch, the crimson coat of Romanorus imp, had been a sign of war. Or what they know, that Guinea color would accustom the soldier to despise the blood of the spindle, or that the blood of the emperor's slain might be seen, crimson in color, suffering from bleeding blood. But the significance of the colors for the diversity of nations is diverse. I am interrupting here. It appears indeed, I say, that we often reveal the secrets of our soul, even in silence, but what is the result? Give yourself to me, says Pomponius, and you will understand. I want this before all things a silent God strives to gain prudence, not only put a bit on the mouth, but also the other parts of the body, and to that extent all his gestures and actions, know the said facts, and no less in gesture than in speech, the fault of solicitude is found, while one thing is shown by the voice, another by a nod, or with the hand. When once the Olympic Games were celebrated at Smyrna, over which Polemus presided, and the actor there, unsatisfied, stretching out his hand to the ground, would have exclaimed, O oh Jupiter, suspecting the sky and pointing his hand at it, Polemus, detesting the man's inexperience, rushed into the theatre with these words. If the gestures and countenances disagree with the prayer, let us call them sad and cheerful, and affirm some things while denying them. Not only is authority lost by words, but also faith, beauty comes from gesture and movement, says Quintilian. Therefore, Demosthenes, looking into a certain large mirror, used to compose the action. Herod Atticus, the famous sophist, the death of Regula's wife, of which he himself had been the author, helplessly mourning, when he was clothed with black curtains and black clothes, but in the meantime he was clothed with white roots, Philostratus writes that he gave his rival the opportunity of Sioma. This can be drawn, he is a lover of sad larceny, and the Borticus and the Leucophaetus, he who does not think that rednecks are men, Amethystine ask, he calls women's clothes, he praises the native, he may have and may always dark colors, he has a gallant character. You want to be loved and gentle by all, what happens, then, that you are proud of your driving pleasure. And or I hide in disgust. Have you not noticed that even the greatest princes were excommunicated for such things? Tiberius Caesar, before he had obtained the principality, proceeded with a stiff neck, and obstinate, brought almost to a yalt, in which all things are ungrateful and full of arrogance, says Suetonius, and Augustus observes in him, and he tried to excuse himself. Wisely professed openly in the Senate, and professed that nature is a vice, not of mind, let there be cheerfulness in your countenance, combined with a certain dignity, humble flattery is absent, 
let us not consult too much with gravity, let not thy austerity be sad, let not thy kindness be dissolute, lest from thence arise hatred, from thence scorn. Dear friend, receive the said friend, with a kind face, if you are glassy-skinned, you will not be moved by gestures, suspicious faith is ruer, it seems malicious. You want to be affable, and to those who are difficult to speak to you, you provide access, these do not meet. The ambassadors of the Lacedaemonians therefore declared, who, when they had been sent by the tyrant Ligdom to whom they had been sent, had several times requested, but in vain, the opportunity to present an embassy, and they answered that the prince was not very stable in health, they were indignant and declared that they had come not to fight with him, but to converse with him. How much better is Trajan, of whom Pliny, Horet, says, whosoever comes to your side, the end of his speech is his shame, not your pride. If we talk, you tremble under the head, do you twist your mouth, spit in the face of those who speak to you, sneer away, or gesture with your hands in such a way as to drive away flies. Too many of these best words are worn out. Modest and noble, you want to be seen, what is it, then, that you wear clothes whose form is theatrical, or whose color betrays the lightness of your soul? You strive for humility, and in clothes, furniture, etc., you exceed the limit. Whose madness is it to bear the census bodily? But I am a god, you say, from those who are more wealthy, it matters nothing. A little worship, they act with undisguised means, and they manage large sums of money, without ostentation, without pride, with the appearance of mediocrity. You want to be seen as a man, and adorn your body with the dress of a woman, you break your hair, you soften your voice to female flattery, and firmness of the body with women. For where, says the satiric, do they look like a comb? At what pace was the study composed? And not even the blisters of the feet, out of measure aberrant. The average worship, he adds to the people, as the Greek testifies to the verse, with the increase of the right. But the feminine and the lustful, does not adorn the body, but exposes the mind, said Quintilian. Look at that old woman who wants to appear chaste before others, while the posture of the body, the mischievous eyes, and the most luxurious clothes betray a most indecent, as the spoils of our opprobri drags through the mouth. Or to live in matronly clothes, he asked the ill level of life to wear them. In the honorable world of the matrons, the drone is not to be looked upon, not pigments, not tools, no facial cosmetics, they thus increase the elasticity, the beauty of the form, and the color of the skin, that they diminish the reputation of honesty, which is recommended by virtue, not by the shape of the mouth and locks. Look again at that Cato, whom you thought to be magnanimous above all others, and indeed Cato, behold, this little one, the misfortune that has befallen him from across the street, he walks forward struck by lightning, so that whoever is silent is all pain in his face, in which these verses of Euclean are easily read, alas, poor wretched me, peri, badly lost, badly adorned with it. Only groans, and bad trouble, this God offered me, hunger and poverty. I am the most lost, I am always in the land. If the lot of the enemy of the left has done anything to you, be prudent, do not be sure to give pleasure to your enemies. Now let us propose to ourselves, somewhere the Palatine, he who directs all his nerves to him, as a prince whom he serves, must understand that he is loved by him, as love begets love. Nevertheless, whether the prince laughs or grieves, he remains a savage, it is like a Sicani rock, which could not be moved by the siren's song or cry. You think the marble is missing. What are you doing poor? Do you not see that this harshness is like enmity? Who, not congratulating the prince on his success, renders himself a suspect. But he who rejoices, laughs, or entertains concubines during the mourning or illness of his prince, is worthy of that penalty, which the Roman Senate find L. Fulius Argentarius, he who, during the Second Punic War, had looked out of the windows through the south, into the forum, crowned with a rosy wreath, was imprisoned as long as the war lasted, he lived as a freedman, as the untimely joy to which he had been in laboring for his country, the trouble of prison should be corrected. This is to be understood as flattery. Let us have a court worthy of servants, far from anything cheaper, 
as they cook often, with the delicacy of the dishes, so flatterers by serving pleasures, and by feeding them, corrupt the minds of the magnates. It is found that there are none who, while they wish to be spoken of, and affect laughter, that they may gain favor, mimes, actors or even clowns, gesticulating, even in the prince of the month, he acts, but so clumsily in the crowd, that it is a wonder that the more powerful bear them, that neither Sarmentus had brought the unjust to Caesar's table, nor the vile Galba, it is too foolish, to please others, to make yourself outcast and vile. Anacarsis the Scythian, being made fun of by those who were brought into the marriage, stood without laughing. As soon as the ape was brought forward, he gesticulated, he laughed, and said in a whisper, that this is indeed a ridiculous effect of nature, that man should remember it. Adalia. What is the use of speaking modesty if your actions speak the opposite? For if you are with the lustful, I will tell you what kind of member he is. A shadow is a companion, either yours, or you its shadow. Or if you frequent suspicious places, or do you delight in pure spectacles. The harder front of this, who sits and watches the tribulations of the patricians. Marcus Portius Cato, watching and the slaw games which the commissioner was performing, cut off, and began to silently demand that the people should be stripped of their clothes as mimes. Whence Marshall said, Why did you come to sit in Cato's theatre? Or did you come only to leave? In short, what is the use of praising sobriety from time to time, if the table meets you drunk? So long as you do not put yourself in a gurgling hole, but you also cause this inconvenience to others, as you force your body to drink as much as you see it. See how many cups we drink, as many as there are fingers in the hand. It remains that we are also speaking of those who are curious, and are in the least desirous of other people's secrets, when they wish to be seen, nevertheless, if they happen to observe two whispering more secretly among themselves, they are unable to conceal their curiosity, without immediately joining those thirds, and listening to their conversations audibly. In the plan, when you see the two talking leave willingly, or if anyone sat by them, perhaps read the letters, bowing his head to see what they contained, that they might discover, I would cast my eyes on the paper, that they might not be afraid, not without the stomachs of the onlookers. And lastly of those who strive to keep away from themselves the mark of slander as far as possible, but from time to time they utter the tongue of a mocker, so that, however much they may restrain their speech, yet they show themselves to be the greatest of mockers by their noses and other gestures. Speak evil of them, even if it is evil. The controlled laughter of the offspring is a sure beauty. But, I will not collect the rainwaters, if I would like to list everything of this kind, as many ears of corn he carries the fronds of the wood, and casts out the dry seashore. These, then, are sufficient, for to teach what manner of manner is to be kept in every action, is very difficult, if not impossible. Offices vary with persons, times, ages, the nature of things, the manners of men, and the custom of places. Indeed, what variety, to pursue one another, would be of a man who sees all things very keenly. The sum of these returns, all things, not only said, but also done, are to be shunned, which may be turned against us by vice, and we must be careful, that our gestures, movements, walking, standing, sitting, crouching, hands, eyes, voice, should be free from all suspicion. That is to say, that all our things should be directed to an equal standard, so that those whose countenance honors, their manners dishonor, the mind which adorns more beautiful, let the body desist. Homer, as the wisest of all, ascribes to this the supreme control of all his actions, everything obeyed reason, he could command his countenance not to change, with the eyes as if they were restrained by tears, God's heart, let it not tremble, his tongue, that he should not speak. I pray thee, what is the reason of that most honorable voice of Galba, I read that I did not buy a soldier from him, for he must have been a stranger, because, as Tacitus says, the others were not of the same form. He will never be considered sober who has lived through the pretense of curios and bacchanalia. Pomponius having given the words there, he pauses to speak. He joined, as I have said, do not pretend that you possess yourself, my son, before all things you must take care of your heart. 
for what matters is who you are, than who you are not. Those who, by the manner of their mouths and sad countenances, in the person of sobriety, conceal the most loathsome and terrible vices, outwardly believing a deceptive and false sanctity, which however, is generally their destruction, because the simulation is discovered. For example, if someone wears a garment that is strange to his stature, very different from the habit of the body, let it not be easily accomplished by art, as plainly, it seems suitable to him, so he who takes upon himself the parts of a prudent man, from whose character he is far removed, common men may perhaps fail for a time, but those to whom judgment is sharper will never fail. By nature also extorting this from the Inuits, that they may fall through imprudence, which are talents rather than persons. It is difficult to imitate false gods, it is difficult to imagine a sad, funny mind. Therefore the mind is to be taken care of, from it the senses, from it the words spring forth, from it we have the attitude of the countenance, the manner of walking. To him who is healthy and strong, his speech and action are robust, strong, and manly, if he instead reclines, and see, they follow the fall. The mind, says Seneca, is our king. This unscathed, the rest remain in duty, care, and obey. When he staggered a little, they nodded at the same time, but when he has yielded to pleasure, all his actions perish. The right mind submits to itself other things, himself to no one, here I am, having spoken again, in your, I say, my old speech. Make me happy, and at the same time make me grieve, it is too difficult to form and shape the mind and body in such a way as you teach, to arrange life, to control actions, to know what to do and what to omit, and to direct the course through the waves of waves. Indeed, says Pomponius, this view was seen by many who, without any guards or supports, had thus crossed the fords, and to whom assiduous, for a long time, she was a teacher. For he, indeed, this appearance of prudence, bearing many adversaries inflaming, vexing, learning one thing, unlearning another, the disciple is of the former, the latter day, they have been acquired, yours is another reason, the gift of which nature, diligent education has helped, learning has embellished. But let us continue, and before we say anything about controlling the language, let us say, we will explain it in a few words, by what reason should we be understood to speak, when both our tongue and our actions are silent. It is easy for you to know this from the books of the Iuris Consultorum, Jurists. You know, where manifest dissent is required, he who is silent must be understood. Therefore silence, he says, is a kind of confession, against the questioning of the adversary. If the father, for example, is present, the son is created decurious, and the father is silent. Is considered to agree. Heliogabalus, the most important, used to ask each of the senators whether he was ready for Venus. While the old men were silent and blushing at the same time, he cried out, he is ashamed, it is a healthy matter. They are silent. So, sometimes we declare defiance, sometimes attention. Further hearing. In silence, sometimes, we can make a change. It is agreed, says Valerius Max. The young man produced on his forehead, with his face fixed on the ground, and in his shy silence, was greatly valued in his self-discipline. It is sometimes a sign of silent magnanimity, the wife of Arminus, says Tacitus, was neither overcome with a voice, nor overcome with tears, clasping her hands in her bosom, she gazed at the grave man. The surest sign of a heartless thought is in an angry man, if silence conceals his anger. Moreover, in the clandestine opposition to the prince, the counsels of those who help and those who hold back are held in the same place. If in the assembly of princes they are proposed less honorable, or certainly less expedient for the common good, and when questioned, keep silent, no doubt you seem to consent by silence. He says, after a man who is accustomed to compel a friend in writing or by voice, if he ceases, the friendship seems to have renounced, and it becomes obsolete with a kind of silent rust, the covenant of souls, he says. In the midst of these conversations, the boy, at the lady's command, came with a message, breakfast prepared according to the custom of the nation. I turned to Pomponius, 
who was looking at me, and said, Let us let the children have their breakfast, and let us take care of them. Here is your speech before all my food, I beg you, let us not interrupt. When you so desire, my son, it requires time for us to discuss the reason for restraining the tongue. He is as if clothed with the mind, the words are, with which he walks clothed, for we recognize a man by his voice, not even by looking at his face, just as Protogenes knew Apelles from a single line. So from a single answer, someone's talent and prudence are detected, or ignorance. Therefore, as many words as you make, imagine that you will produce as many marks and indications of your mind, which will give credit to your manners and character. Whenever Cicero says something, we either say or speak, whenever we are judged. To Cato he returns the same token, that is to say that he had never uttered a word that he was sorry to have uttered. First of all, therefore, it is necessary to know, by keeping silent wisely, to mark him who speaks wisely, the one cannot exist without the other. I am always evil to be silent, as it is always evil to speak. Nay, silence is often deemed worthy of greater hatred, as from the calculations of iniquity, thus, at meetings, especially when happy, these dumb people are removed. Sad and silent, life, like deep rivers. Let us now approach the matter more closely, in general this should be observed, as a rule, that a politician, even a multi-talented one, should not be a polyglot, as empty vessels tinkle the most, so those who have the least mind are the most talkative, it is the nature of things, that those who stammer more, speak more, says Symmachus, and complain impatiently of the commendation of the tongue, and elsewhere I hate, says he, long veils on a small body, that garment is decently put on, with which it does not attract dust, nor let it be trodden down to the ground, when the comedian, seeing Leandricus, dragging his delicate garment on the ground with the flow, cried out, what a madman this man is, he scatters the shawl. I have rightly enumerated the best form of speech, which includes many things in a few. Just as in the gods, those are considered the most precious, to whom the dignity of materials, and the excellence of metals, it is not the reason of greatness that wins authority, Pindar, praising Epaminondas, writes that he did not easily find another who knew more, or spoke less. Rightly Theodoric, king of the Goths, who, when writing to the senate at Rome, says, it is too rare for the fathers to speak solidly, and to whom it is necessary to say much. Do not utter hesitation. A peculiar praise of the Lacedaemonians was once, in very few words, to include a great deal of sensibility, when things take hold of the mind, words run wild. Just as the Celtibers obey the iron, after they have dug it into the ground, and wiped off the excess and the earth, so they spoke the laconic discourse, covered with no bark, and all that was superfluous cut off, it must have a temperature, that is, the force of things can be more effectively executed and expressed. Indeed, it is with broken hair, thus the fame was reborn, he is said to have taught Pythagoras, who was very talkative, they would so ambiguous words, on the contrary, every one is, he answered, or it is not rule, for there is nothing shorter, nothing more complete, these which they approve of, all leave weak. No one remained silent, many spoke briefly. Homer shows that princes, especially men, should be short-spoken. Who makes Menelaus, who speaks eloquently but briefly, give a frequent sermon to the soldiers, says Tacitus of Galba, to the emperor's short tote, he pronounces Piso to have been adopted by himself, following the example of due Augustus, and the military manner in which man should read man. Phocian, sometimes what was he to meditate on? Being asked, he answered that, relying on it, he would cut short the speech he was about to give to the people, it is attributed to the Emperor Charles V. It is most unseemly for you to speak to a multitude, either in the Senate or in the councils of a prince, too long in speech, or too elaborate in appearance, or sentences and reasons plucked from places too rehearsed, to usurp too long. Augustus Caesar's style of speaking, as Tranquillus testifies, followed an elegant and temperate one, of life's foolish opinions, and of clumsiness, and of secret words, and he took great care to express his feelings as openly as possible. Having established these things, we will first make some words about them, 
which are to be kept silent in every place and among all, and of these things, which are to be avoided in speech, of that kind are all things which show the divine majesty, or the least, and consequently. They seem to hurt, so that if any one dares to abuse some saying of the holy scriptures in order to excite laughter, who frequents some courts more than enough, or the priests will be scurrilously bugged, for to say nothing of divine vengeance, which often proceeds slowly, but at a certain rate, late comes the greatest fault of the wicked. It is certain that the ears of the good man I was greatly offended by these and ridiculous speeches. And to other great and more powerful men, though evil and absent, we must speak only honorifically, if this really cannot be done, let us be silent. How quick to praise the prince, how safe to keep silent about the prince. It is too arrogant of a man to take judgment on so many men. Whence the losses are often to be feared as the most numerous. Do you not know that kings have long hands? But there is no benefit. If with your prince you speak more freely of other great men, he will easily incline to it, so that he decides to expect the same from you at some time. Be among equals, they will gather this from thence, a language which does not spare the great, it gives much less to the lesser, on equal occasion. This is to be extended. So that we may temper all the humors in them, of which among the powerful, there is a long history, says Tacitus. When Telecephasus, a powerful man, in a certain marriage, had spoken against Arsinochum, the wife of King Lysimachus, with words, Lysimachus at once threw him into the cave, and ordered him to be surrounded and burned to death in the manner of wild beasts. Sotus is of Crete, having been shut up in a vessel of lead for a similar cause, perished miserably by drowning in the sea. That name is Tiberius, who went from Augustus' nation. Rothano's legacy would be delayed, and perhaps with him, the dead should be brought up, and a certain mime cried out, addressing the dead man, report to Augustus, not yet on behalf of his ambassadors, to the satisfaction of the Roman people, but a little later he ordered him to be put to death, in order that Augustus might be informed that his legations had already been received. We must beware of all lies, indeed, of all things that are not like the truth. If you do not know for sure, leave everything as if uncertain, there is nothing worse than a liar, especially from flattery, the meanest and most pernicious kind of lying, which is done by them out of a desire to please, to whom the prince was honorable, it is dishonorable, it is to be praised. For them, says the sacred page, who sow the dust under every elbow of the hand, and seruicals under the head of the magnates, for for this purpose the dust is placed, that they may rest better, so that he who ought to have been rebuked for a fault may rest softly in it, supported by praise. But neither can this lie be of long duration. He is a flatterer who blooms in short season, there is no one who rejoices in the canaparasite. It sometimes happens that, while we are trying to win over princes, we stumble greatly, so open to flattery, as if they were setting before themselves the appearance of ridicule, as if you were the most timid Achilles or Hercules, you prefer Aristides, the judge of the infamous iniquity, this price, says Tacitus, Gallius, meditating flattery, immediately took it to the court, and afterwards to Italy. And because he was accused of easily tolerating exile, beloved Lesbos, a noble and pleasant island, they will withdraw the word, and it will be kept in the houses of the magistrates. Also from all threats, especially vain and untimely, to abstain, do not threaten with a word, for you can do it either way, it would be foolish to remind you, if you know you can, you are a beast and a fool, from these same dietaries, which meet in many, as if whole nations had begun, or orders, or condition, or the studies of many, nothing more hateful, shameful, and that, if that is objected to the oppose. Be known, of which matter a little later. Many a curse others make to themselves. To say to the poor like that I am inhuman by way of jest, or because they lack guilt, or because he can fall back on himself who objected. In a gentle cove, even a smile is wrong, what can happen to anyone can happen to others. Obscene, this side of the controversy belongs here. Nor are words like ours, and impure words to be avoided, but also foreign, and all narratives that do not breathe modesty. For the mills may vex it to us. Asana is the page of life. Likewise, that lecherous verse was chaste in mind, 
The image of the mind, he says, is speech, what kind of man is such a speech each person gives such things outside as the mind is inside. To Seneca's father, a most prudent man. As Suetonius, it is turned into vice. That they describe the crimes of the internodes in this way, that they seem to laugh rather than to hate, to teach how to detest such obscene outbursts as Seneca made about his mirrors, and with Suetonius about the hateful loves of Tiberius, Caligula, Nero, and Domitian. Not so Virgil, who describes the unfortunate meeting of Aeneas and Dido, says, Dido, the duke, and Troy come to the cave, shame forbade him to advance further. The same can be said of Homer, in whom everything is chaste and modest. If, then, we are obliged to keep silent about what others say and do that depart from modesty, how much more must we cover our own shame? That they should come to hate him altogether. Who delight in recounting their whoredoms and adulteries as heroic deeds? For the example of Proculus the emperor, who used to boast here and there that he had taken a hundred virgins from Sarmatia, of these he had married ten in one night, but all the women returned within a fortnight. Or of that tyrant of Milan, who was wont to fling at the most noble matrons with equal impudence. I certainly, says Apuleius somewhere, would have said that for my captive, nothing less than that mouth belongs to a free and liberal man. Get rid of all those who wallow in your own mire. The cats conspired to cover the earth with their excrements, and thus to hide them, and you beasts, of course, are more playful, you wish to be exposed. Nothing in life and character is more lovable than honesty. Speech will pass into feeling, if we speak honestly. The honesty of words, moreover, consists either in their sound or in their meaning. For they are terms signifying an honorable thing, which, in voice and sound, have something dishonest. Where, then, do such things occur, to be avoided, or to be substituted for others, or to be pardoned? What shall we say about perseverance, and the study of contentions? Contend a little, it is a fungal victory. Alcibiades was praised for his pipe, which deforms the attitude of the mouth. Had thrown away, in it he rivaled Minerva, the governor of wisdom, which, when she played to the mirror of the pipe, was projected, offended by the deformity of the mouth, which, indeed, how much more accurately, a politician will warn, which is most fitting, according to the rule of wisdom, to compose the manners. Unworthy, if you happen to be, from the ministries of any one, at any other time, by an impious act, or by a rash word, immediately, as if disturbed by his state of mind, he hides himself in a foul manner, with distorted lips, and to a fighting dog, which is more like a man, to rage, to growl, to incessantly fight, for not only the house, but the whole neighborhood, was filled with sleepless cries. No matter, says Seneca, that you receive lightly, you have nothing to be indignant about except by being indignant. Note that, he who is cruel to his servants often says to others that he lacks not the will, but the ability. No less to be avoided, I often made oaths about the cause. Therefore, he wants to believe in you. And from all the proofs, to show if you have done good to someone, I am careful, grace perishes altogether from reproach, and the price was immediately paid without benefit. You know that to believe me, you have given me huge posthumous gifts the author perishes by his chatter, why many. What is shameful indeed, is also shameful in speech. To pursue all things in silence, I have neither training nor talent, it is sufficient that he pointed out these things with his finger. The old man here briefly interposed silence, my eyes, I say, I feel opened by them, and now I am thinking how I can sometimes adapt these things. But there remains one thing that I would like to touch you, on the arcanes, good advice, said Pomponius, I was going thither. My secret is yours, the others are committed to your faith, remaining secret, secrets of the house, put in the place of the treasure. Augustus was noted, by the wisest of his age, that the indecency of his daughter Julia, and thus disclosing the secrets of his own house, he brought upon himself both infamy and bewilderment. Indeed, he was forced to banish his only daughter, than by his silence, by his domestic rule. That is, why and diligently before, he would have been able to cope, 
with a healthy imagination. There is a voice worthy of Marcellus, if I had thought that this coat of mine was privy to my secret, I would have thrown it from the track into the fire. Never let the underwear know that you are preparing a gown. And what you want to silence, silence others first. The philosopher rightly observed, as he says, he does not go beyond his own limits, but one thing continued, but the difference is indefinite, for it immediately falls away from itself, passing into the multitude by doubling. By the same token, a discourse that does not depart from one thing is truly mysterious, but if it is shared with another, it is already consecrated to fame. Just as he who threw a stone had the power to throw it, he does not have the power to hold it back afterwards, so that he who intercepts a secret mission will never be pursued, so that the same may return, as it were, in the afterlife. You will succinctly tell him that of the vain women, in whose pocket you have deposited the secret, I say these things to you alone, please let them be with you, as the handmaiden of Apollina, when, says she, I will commit myself to the penetratives of this religious breast of yours, I will always remain within the precept, with closed guards I pray, to the nest of silent faith. For in like manner he will share them with another. And if you have not commanded yourself, how can you expect silence from another? These things in private, both of our own, and of strangers, to which I add, once upon a time you who believed in the secrets of the member, if the lot make enemies, there is no opening. In those which your magistrate has entrusted to you, no less, rather, with greater reason, work. He adorns, says Cassiodorus, the husband, the prince's secret, while none are esteemed as necessarily committed, unless they have been firmly established in faith. The law of the Egyptians commanded that the tongue of him who had revealed the secrets of the Republic should be cut off. He had revealed it to someone. He who cannot commit to silence is black. From whom great things cannot be sustained. Among other things, Epaminondas makes it remarkable to the Thebans, the enemy of Probus, that he was concealing in the first place what had been committed. Cover the pledges faithfully, or don't let your ears suck. Pompeius is celebrated for his virtue, who, while serving as an ambassador, he was intercepted by the Gentian king, when he was ordered to betray the plans of the Senate, to the burning lamp, he offered his finger to be burned. And with that patience, he shook the king at the same time, and despair, of knowing anything by the tortures, and desiring the friendship of Pop. Rom. He gave birth to a great desire. He was faithful, said Valerius Max, and the chest of Reap was high, why does silence heal the eight, fortified and veiled? Entering the threshold of which, having cast off their private charity, they put on the public one. I will not say one thing, but you would believe that no one heard what had been committed to so many ears. I am happy to leave out several others, the grips of the mysteries, the spurs of against, plates, crosses, swords, strength, master, prisons, little things, legs hours, I went on, because my mind was drunk with drunkenness, it is not in his power, to be carefully guarded against inundation of wine. Just as casks are broken with must, and everything that lies at the bottom is thrown to the top by the force of heat, thus, when the wine boils, whatever lies hidden at the bottom is brought forth and comes forth into the middle. It is an old one, to swim in a sober tongue, that which was hidden in a sober heart. They are merely burdened, says Seneca, just as they do not contain food, overflowing with wine, so that he did not even penetrate the secret, his own and the stranger's with wine. The weight of the member is obtained, the trembling legs are hastened, slow-witted the league, the mind is wet, dwarf eyes, cries, hiccups, quarrels, slip. Moreover, by the word of the secrets entrusted to you, I do not mean only those which seem to be more secret confederations, but all that, even outside the doors of the Senate, a prince, or perhaps a private neighbor, or a friend of yours, probably wishes to be hidden. Strangers are prudent and difficult, and do not talk to each other. Have you never been warned that the spittle that magnates excrete is immediately rubbed on their feet by the bystanders? The reason is similar to these. What, therefore, the prince did or said more freely within the walls of his palace, or those of his neighbors, if you please to report without discrimination. 
as some of the courtiers who do not listen to the tongue, should pierce it, or at least feed it, while they also have these words in their mouths with the third word, when my prince rose, he said this today, he did that yesterday. He already has it in mind, you will be considered the most worthy of hatred, and you will not escape the name of the most talkative, for talkativeness is not said to be so great, with respect to many words rather than to the reason of the subject, of which not even when it is not necessary whence, if you look at faith, sometimes treachery. If the grace of conversation, the trouble and fear of most people. Here, before I summarize the rest, I say that it is a matter of no less danger, in the case of others, and at the same time to inquire into the secrets of the generals and chiefs of the war, rather than to betray them, because those two soldiers of Maximinus. Out of curiosity, they were killed before the doors of the Senate, Otho elegantly says in Tacitus, some soldiers should not know as much as they need to know. Military affairs are restrained by protecting fellow soldiers rather than by usurping the empires of their leaders. Paulus Aemilius, with no less seriousness, says that a soldier ought to take care of these three things, to have a body as strong and destructive as possible, suitable weapons, with a mind prepared for sudden commands, let him know the rest, to take care of these immortals and his emperor. In which army the soldiers, the commander and the emperor, are surrounded by the rumors of the common people, there should be nothing to sabotage. That he would avail himself, that he was of the emperor's office, that he might give them an opportunity of doing things well, to ask them for nothing that is to come, when the signal was given, then I was to embark the military op. What we have said of the soldiers, we also say of the courtiers. Lest they should be seen to have become spies from faithful ministers. Abducted, says Tacitus, the sense of the prince, and if there is anything more secret than equal, to seek out, elicit, anceps, nor therefore attain which the Asinius galley teaches by example. Tiberius Caesar was more grieved at nothing, than if he observed the more secret feelings of his soul when they were exposed. And so the fathers had one fear if they seemed to understand. Indeed, to the fisherman, who had unexpectedly offered a large mullet to the private agent of the Caprii, to rub his face with the same fish. What would he have done, if he had seen the follies of some of the courtiers, who, with the utmost zeal, were being hunted down, what the king had said in the ear of the queen, what Juno had been stoned with love. Praiseworthy indeed of that great man. The discovery of the man, who, being asked by a certain curious man, what Caesar had heard, had said so long a speech. He replied that he had not heard of Caesar, that there were some curious persons in the court, who were inquiring into his secrets, and that these were to be punished. And now I am talking about the type of punishment. The other was silent, and did not appear to ask anything out of curiosity. I never, says Apuleius somewhere. I have endeavored to know the wrongdoing of every one, but I have always preferred to cover my own sins, rather than to bear the burden of others. It might be asked here, whether all the things mentioned come to be avoided. It raises doubts, because we sometimes read that great men boasted a certain confidence in themselves and their own merits. There is an envious oration of Scipionis Africani. On this quit day, the tribunes of the people and the Quirites fought well and successfully with Hannibal and the Carthaginian standards in Africa. And so it is fair to put aside the quarrels and quarrels of the present day, I immediately went from here to the capital to Jove opt. Myself, I will go to salute Juno and Minerva, and the other goddesses who preside over the capital and the citadel, and I thank them for giving me on this very day, and soon after others, the excellent republic. They gave the ability to carry the mind. You also, whoever is convenient, go with me Quirites, and pray to the gods that you may have princes like me. So if, from the age of seventeen to old age, I have always preferred my time to the honors of your predecessors, who ever spoke more eloquently of himself. And yet it was not through fault that it was given to Scipio, or that a great man of rep. If meritorious, if it is regarded in unworthy ways, let it not be disrespectful to the meritorious remp, the commemoration, you know that you deserve the pride you deserve. Or that he should have produced the day that had been told to him, so that he were granted more easily to Linternum, with a certain plan that he should not be present at the trial. 
the mother's mind was subject to the same nature as it was, and accustomed to the greater lot, rather than to be guilty. And I submitted, I was then told the cause in humility. Therefore, not all ostentation, but only that which is affected and foolish, which does not fall upon great minds, is to be discouraged. To a certain extent, a dignified flaunting is defended by age, dignity, and authority, which, however, were hardly ever so great. That of the orator is not to be criticized here, what do I think? No contempt. I do not see, nor in life, nor in grace, nor in things accomplished, nor could Antony despise anything in this mediocrity of mine. But Antony I, an excellent leader among others, is criticized, because he was too much to mention what he deserved. Cicero after having oppressed Catiline everywhere. Consul for me, O fortunate born Rome! With what importunate display, he often incurred the hatred, even of the better ones, it is not unlike the matter of Marshall's elegant epigram, I closed the mouth, the father's nose, the two lights of the father, and you say that you have more gestures than yours. When you refer to the ancients, and no part of the body you lie, tell me whose forehead you have. He is the most inept at heart, and most annoyingly, who recites his poems, written elsewhere, from time to time for the sake of anyone, and thereby receiving praise, and the law standing and the law sitting, current law and law abiding, I run away to the baths, my sister is in my ear, I'm asking for a pool, you're not allowed to swim, hasten to heaven, you hold the count, I come to dinner, sitting down. How much more prudent the other, do not recite it to anyone, except to friends, and do not compel us everywhere, and in the presence of whom you please. But what shall we say of those, to whom I have nothing else in my mouth than to praise nobility, honors, children, wives, and riches? He will be jealous of his foolishness. The player, I did not know that she was silent, it is foolish to say that you are, that you are not, poor thing. If you boast that you are equally noble, equally honest and energetic, what else do you do but oppose yourself to them? If among the inferiors, what else but to reproach them for their baseness and miseries? Neither of whom he can please. Our mind, says Quintilian, has by nature something sublime and erect, and impatient of the superior, therefore, we willingly train those who are rejected or submit themselves, because we are seen to do this as elders, and whenever emulation departs, humanity succeeds. The diminution of self, not indeed so hateful, yet to be shunned, lest we should show that we either do not know the virtues, or despise them. To worship oneself basely, says Apuleius, is self-contempt. To attack others barbarously, insulting. Prudent farmer, who did not depress himself at all, nor did he leap upon his fame from his deeds. To the author and leader, as the minister, he referred to fortune, so he was brave in obeying, shameless in proclaiming it, beyond envy, nor beyond glory. And I will say these things, let it suffice to say about them, that a man of great birth, should always and everywhere be silent. For of the rest, that is, of wrongs, insults, and others, which injure our shame and the piety of others, or empty, deceitful, ridiculous, sophistic, or seditious, to make longer words is of no advantage. Does not the greatest insult, says Medorensis, impose on you who thinks that you are cursing the best, for the enjoyment of each. And do not understand vicious words. Or if you understand, to consult the good. Let us, therefore, at last come to those things which must be observed in the discourse, whence it must be repeated at the beginning. No one deserves the praise of silence, who lacks prudence to speak. This is too vulgar, not to be omitted here, for it is never said too much because it is never learned enough nature has given man a single tongue and two ears, that he may understand twice as much what he hears as what he speaks. Whose opinion is not dissimilar to the song of Theonis, who complains about the stupidity of men, when the common people have more to hide than to show, from these, the doors of the tongue, I did not pay any attention. Tongues, a lock, without a doubt. He called a certain law of temperance, and modesty, or of modesty and shame, which free men impose upon themselves. As the mind, rushing headlong, 
by means of words flying beyond the fence of the teeth, let him check with drawn fins, and compel him to pair his reasonings. For if there is anything hidden in his breast that offends treachery, he promises to be buried in deep silence against the unloved, if they are present to be praised, it is to be hoped that the less often they are heard, the dearer and more excellent their future will be. Very ridiculous is the manner of those who answer the questioner before he has finished saying, with what speed, often absurd, lest I say anything else, because they did not perceive the object proposed, they are forced to bring it into the middle. In the same way that it was not seen through the current he stops at the step, but is carried away by the weight of his body. And further than he willed, and where he did not will, he is brought forth, the mountain is pulled down by huge rocks, and the side of it hangs down with a nail, so that speed of speech is neither in his power, nor sufficiently dignified. Rightly, the ancients used to say that prayer should not be born in the tongue but in the heart. That is, before we open our mouths, let's look around, let us hear, let us rest, not anything but the matter, or a little advantage, let us say, like never a skilled archer, he sends his weapon, without first having premeditated the target in mind, so no one should speak before he has perished. To which end he says, and whose words are to have an outcome, which is certain, that they cannot be called back, and what I left behind is that evil is to be feared. It is a fool to forestall the lights of the mind with words, but you are the progeny of a better genius, in the middle of the whirlwind I control the tongues and conqueror, quick to hear, slow and careful to speak. In all matters of great importance, it is a thing above all useful, to withdraw from the conversation of men, viz., that which even the republic or find out that they are more agreeable to you, and put them forward in the midst of your meditations. That great African, in the hours of the Antilucans, daily ascending to the capital in the temple of Jupiter, what things were to be said to him, or was contemplated to be done. Whatever you are going to say, tell yourself where you are going to say it. At his example, who speaks like Varro, before blowing the pipes in the orchestra, he was breaking off his branches. But let me return to private conversations, to consider where one, what cause when with whom, and what do you say. It would not be wise for a person to speak of a divorce, deploring the death of his wife or of his son's daughter. Who forbids the mother, unless she is mentally incompetent, to infuse the newborn with tears? This is not the place to be warned. When he has given his tears, his soul, he has filled the sick woman's pain with words. Nor is it less silly, between meals, the spirit of those who met with causes of joy, to disturb the narrative, of executions and carnage, of tragic cases and horrendous spectres, I used to exult in marriages with men, and to mingle with feasts, fierce spectacles, often fought with swords. And if by the falling cup itself, you sprinkled not sparingly with the blood of the month, few are so firm as not to be moved by such things. Many excellent things are found, which were not said in their proper place or in their warmth, or they appear funny or hateful. Therefore Tiberius, with the ambassadors of the Ilians of the death of Drusus, who consoled them as if the memory of the pain had already been forgotten. No, he replied without a smile, he also grieved their turn, because they had lost the excellent Hector. In all family practice, nothing is more accommodative than mutual conversation, which is done by asking and answering, but if you ask what causes the other to blush, you will be most ungrateful, for example, if someone has done something unhappily through his negligence, do not appear to object, or what secrets we may suspect another to want, or of which he is unconscious, and unskilled, as the praise of a shoe, is to fit the foot properly, so the speech is put to the matter. A standard made of gold, if it is not right, the matter is indeed precious, but it cannot be in any way normative, for he cannot perform his task of directing the work, the cause of which is found on the contrary, if it is done right, of however cheap materials it may be made, the thing is indeed of no value, but it will be the standard, the same is the reason of the speech. Normag's first rule is that the previous day cannot be made. If he is deceitful, he goes out into the right regions, and the little book, if it limps somewhere, everything happens by mistake. Types of evils are found, which he does not wish to remember what he suffered or transgressed, as with the evils themselves. 
When the poet Aeneas asked Dido to ask for the story of the Trojan War, he answered, Strangely, the queen orders you to renew the pain, who is happy to be asked about the forest environment, about the wanderings of the lusters, about the dogs, if you can often provoke him to tell about the outcome of the hunt, Aeneas says with Macrobius, who was favorably received by reciting, or who carried out an embassy freely and successfully, or who was received courteously and affably by the emperor, or if almost the whole battle was occupied by the pirates, or by his wits or strength alone he succeeded. Jurists are glad to be questioned about the laws, the poet's lodgings on the harmony of music. Let him rejoice, as you say, of his friend's sudden happiness, how voluntarily, he did not dare either to be silent or to speak, this for boasting, that for fear of malice. And there is no doubt that those who died in the new islands, they rejoice greatly when they are asked about that unknown country or gulf of the sea, and gladly answer, and to describe, only with words, only with a ray, all places, thinking it glorious, to keep the hearers hanging from their mouths. Great accomplishments lands, entered so many seas. He was therefore no less learned, and to ask questions rather than to answer them. Of the absent, as we have said, those whose manners do not supply material for the speaker to praise, should not be spoken at random. If impure or wicked men are mentioned by another, it is fitting that we should be more ready to listen than to speak. The walls often, the walls, the arches, and finally, mute, and everything lacking in sense, and they hear and speak after hearing, but not all of them to praise here and there. Where is no one bad who can be good? The unknown, too, is not easily addressed, who would it be, or where would it come from? And whither he would go, I remember that the traveller was asked for safety before. What if the negro hates him, and asks the rightful one? Why many? Intemperate wisdom is often more pernicious than folly, just as paintings by painters, placed in a suitable place, delight, and the same, less advantageously arranged in the light, they are displeased. So our speech, and to that extent all our actions, it is surprising how opportunely they are commended, for sometimes it seems to be placed more in time than in itself. Cain's Mithridatic War. Now tell Postumus about the three hats. In the war of the city of Vitellius and Vespasiani, when he took the Gatos from the tribe of Vitellius to Antonius, and the army of Vespasian, he had sent for peace, Musonius Rufus mixed himself up with the ambassadors, of the equestrian order, the study of philosophy, and the platitudes of the Stoics, rivaled and, mixed with troops, seized the goods of peace, and, distinguishing the dangers of war, moved the armed, to most people it is fun, to many people it is boring. Nor were they worthy of those who would drive them away and avoid them even at the hint of the modesty of each one Tacitus said, I have omitted the untimely wisdom of the untimely. It is in the presence of those whom we observe that our domestics are subjected to bitter expostulations, for he was right, like the bitter ones eaten by others, even your teeth, if you see them cover with astonishment. So we ourselves too are disturbed by the sight of other people's troubles. No less untimely for the children present, want to speak more freely, see, these thresholds touch. Within which is the child, far away from here the beautiful girl, Lenin and the song of the prostitute is a match for the sorcerer, the greatest recollection is due to the child. Nor, therefore, are the friends present, because of scolding others. When Socrates was rebuking a certain family member at table, Plato, turning to him, asked whether it would not have been better to warn the man separately. To whom Socrates, but you, he says, if you do more correctly, do this for me, you would have said do you argue with a friend, and then openly adorn yourself with praises. Aristomenes, who had roused King Ptolemy from his sleep, by the pretended legates, brought to death almost too much, although he ought not to have warned the king, but privately. Of course, there is a nice saying of Ferdinand Caesar, when a certain bishop, speaking to him in Latin, said, this is little Caesar, grammatically, Ferdinand smiling, and this admonition of yours says little about ethics or morals. There are things, says Macrobius, which, if presented to us in the presence of our friends, we could gladly listen to, we do not want any scorn to be said to us as a wife without parents, teachers, or those present. 
I therefore refuse permission to joke. He said sadly, with charming eyes, words, salt, law, grace of speech, laughter, they win by nature and the work of the whiter. The whole eye is smoky, everything, even the smallest things, look around, scarcely anything is more difficult to find, or more artful, than that of the best salts, which not only do not injure the mind, but greatly amuse. As salt, says Quintilian, sprinkled on food, if not excessive, brings something of its own pleasure, so these sales, in speaking, have something that makes us thirst to hear. El Quintus Preta, returned from the administration of the most holy province under Domitian, when a patient told a friend that he had cold hands, the other, laughing, said, you brought them back from the hot provinces a little while ago. Quintus laughed, and was delighted, since he was most alien to the suspicion of thieves. Plutarch ascribes the same to Ophidius Modestius. It is very convenient for him sometimes. We read that he had benefited, when Gisco, one of the illustrious Panarim, said that he was greatly surprised, so great a Roman army at Cannae, standing in readiness. And this surprise seemed to strike fear into his fellow soldiers, to elude him, Hannibal promptly, but that, he says, I think you will be much more surprised, that in so great a number of enemies there is no one named Gisco. This joke moved the bystanders to laughter, the confidence of which leader also brought great hope of victory. Instead, the young men of Tarentine are often broken by hatred and anger, who spoke much more confidently of King Pyrrhus during the meal, when they were asked to account for the fact, and the matter could not be denied, nor could it be defended, for one of them nay, he said, if the flask had failed, we should have killed you. And by this blasphemy all the malice of the crime was dissolved. I said a little before, that great caution should be used in jests, not undeservedly, nothing is said, or should cause anyone to blush, or bring disgrace on someone, or in jests contempt, as elsewhere said, may be accepted. Cicero says that all things which are vindicated in the other, you yourselves must vehemently avoid. Indeed, not only the accuser, but the reprover, why should he be hurt who finds a fault in another? It is detected in itself. In the civil war between Caetera and Pompey, Cicero asking Pompey where his son-in-law Dolabella was. He replied, with your father-in-law? For Caesar was Pompey's father-in-law. Does this seem unworthy to you for a young man's son to have one girlfriend, do you have two wives? Said that creams. When Manius picked up the absent near, blessed are they, someone said, do you not know yourself? Or do you think that you will give words to the unknown? It's too stupid every time a scumbag falls on you without learning it. To escape from the threat, and to wish to destroy a friend rather than what has been said. Which often happens, it was known that Ennius, a flame is more easily suppressed by a wise man with a burning mouth, how many good words he holds, namely these good words that are salty. But and in odious, fire is easier, he said, to press the animated tongue into the pyres, how to keep silence between them. For let them emanate or be secreted from the fertile fields. What if a terrible speech is made for the cause, or miserable, do you not bet on them? To me it will mean nothing more, whosoever dieth in the grave shall tell a joke. It sometimes happens that what we say in opposition, let him also meet others who are sitting, and thus you incur not the hatred of one but the hatred of many, whence great enmities spring, or base satisfaction, says Quintilian. What a good man will say, he will say all things in salutary shame and modesty. For laughter is worth too much, if it is worth the saving of honesty. Cicero was too much in jokes, so much so that Vitinius he would be called a clown. When the consul defended Myrna, who was accused by Cato, he often excited great laughter in the assembly, so that at last Cato was forced to pay him this, good God, what a ridiculous consul we have. Philip is more devoted to nature than befits a king, says Lewius. And not even among the serious ones, sufficiently controlling the laughter, which vice and Seneca also labours with Portius Cato, a man otherwise most exquisite, this object which was of a bitter, and immoderately free tongue. Rhinoceroses, says Pliny, wear horns in their noses, thus certain salts were pierced and pricked. 
and elsewhere, the hystrix does not shoot its spines except when provoked, but the clown threw his words into the clouds. Why are you joking? Savagery Laborage's joke is condemned on Cicero, who, when he was not received by him to the assembly, and Cicero said, I would have received thee if we had not sat narrowly. He said very bitingly, and you used to sit in two chairs. Objecting to him the slippery star, without cause, for what Cicero had said, unless we were to read it narrowly, should be understood as Caesar, who had received so many senators, that they could not take them fourteen steps those, therefore, are proved to be jovial who, when they are verbose, are neither quarrelsome nor proud, neither can they appear to be foreign to the season, nor prepared, as if they had been brought home, whether they are taken from others, or from us, or from things in between. Foreign things, says Fabius, we either criticize or refute, or eliminate, or rebut, or elude. We point out the ridiculous, and the absurd, for the same, if they fall out inadvertently, they are stupidity, if we pretend, they are believed to be charming. The third kind is in deceiving expectations, accepting what is said otherwise, and other things that affect a neutral person, therefore they are called media. Finally, we either do or say funny things. And here my son, silent I think we have taken our boat to some port, here another boat will sail for me. To pursue everything distinctly, not for this place, nor for another, but for many days, I add, and the work of enormous volumes. Let these suffice, these few traces are enough for the mind of the learned, so that you can safely know the rest. If you gather these things into a few, you will find that he who aspires to great things should be so formed, that he composes himself and his whole conversation. That he should not at any rate be cast down from the state of humanity, but that he should constantly watch with concern and anxiety, he was like that Palinurus, with a nail attached and sticking, he never lost sight, and he kept his eyes under the stars. Let him watch, I say, lest whatever he did should be found less agreeable, or said, and with the elders he is old, with the younger he sometimes appears to be young, but not below gravity. Joke, said he, not below the sock, serious not at all, to the shoe. And that likewise, viz. By the art of silence, let him strive. It is one way to speak in the market, another in the temple or council, another in a restaurant, in many ways, at the time of weeping or of joy, with a woman, as a child, learned, uneducated, maddened, rival, privy princes, but to a friend, to a cup, father, mother, the neighbor, the stranger, superior inferior, equal, to mock, drunk, wise, eloquent this is not to be held in speech alone, but in our actions. For we shall observe them in the same manner with dignity forever. And having laid this foundation, to walk so glorious a journey with God, like that noble Virgilian chicken, who was the first to go, and he dares to tempt the faint-hearted, and commit himself to the unknown bridge. Nor does vain noise sweep away. But these are difficult, you say, indeed, all things are excellent and difficult, for by what I have explained to all, who dares to call it excellent. But indeed that which is praiseworthy, and combined with dignity, however difficult. Although the most difficult, even to noble souls this is usually seen as very easy. Driven by labor like a storm, he is cowardly of heart, see that merchant, do not be horrified by the waves of the turbulent sea, to rush through the rocks and through the fires without panicking, to visit unknown regions, in short, to expose life to a thousand dangers, as if he were to perish, he would catch the light, and you will certainly fear some inconveniences, as Republic, by following the example of our ancestors, will you gain good for you and your house, and indeed a great honor, which I wholeheartedly desire, and spread the fame in the cross. He is a way. All great men, not immediately from their mother's womb, but they were wont to come out of hardships and straits. Whence there is one but many rewards of virtue. Pomponius had given up, while I was waiting. In words, my father, I can scarcely express how much I drew from hearing these words of yours, in front of which, not the Arab silvers, not the harvests which Africa reads, I wish, not the wealth which the water has accumulated. I will say, my dear, 
that I feel that this kindness of yours occupies my breast so much that I find nothing, which I hope to perform at any rate, as much as I acknowledge that I owe you, unless I understand that I have labored, lest I should be seen as false, and lest these excellent and salutary precepts of yours be instilled in me in vain. But I will not let you go yet, for in addition to other matters relating to courtly life, which, unless it is too much for you, I expect from noon, and all the smaller matters which come to be observed in the colloquiums of the palatine or the courtiers of the prince, to learn secretly and discreetly from your auspices, I promise with incredible desire, please add this, my father, to the first matter of grace. I beseech you, give me a faithful bank. I saw Pomponius at these things seize his brow with unusual severity, I am speaking with Plautus, when he joined, and the joy is already spoken by me, and your foot, my son, if you have noticed I have placed in the way, the rest are too difficult and too dangerous, by judgment here work and use of things, and these are no more taught by bare precepts, than boxing. But lest you seem to have asked me in vain, to those things which we have warned before, take a few of these also. Before all things we must know the prince with whom we deal, life, nature, and manners. To the example of prudent physicians. It is different with a young man, otherwise with an old man, to deal differently with a prince of the middle age, otherwise with the restrained, otherwise with the sincere, otherwise with the simulator. We see that the older ones are quicker to anger, easier to change, to give willingly, to walk more audibly, to love more fiercely, and it is easier to believe and to hope. The elderly, however, are more likely to wander around, to be often suspected, to talk more, to say more seriously, it is more difficult to be merciful, and to practice generosity less. Cold tar giving old blood dull, and the strength in the body is cold. These and such things, unless one holds fast. In vain he requires the precepts, but we need study, indeed some are found who know how to put on us different looks. Of Audius Cassius the emperor, Volcatius writes, that he was of such manners, as to be seen as a non-sovereign, who was rude and rough, sometimes mild and gentle, often religious, others a despiser of the sacred, audacious of wine, sometimes abstinent, appetite for food, and suffering from hunger, fond of Friday, and lover of chastity. All those who were among the great princes warned by their example that this should be noted in the first conference of the prince. I will add another. When two kinds of conversations with the prince are found, namely, of series and places, two things must be said alike. For indeed in these, besides what we have warned, and let us reap this, let us not at any time speak to you with freedom and kindness from the prince, as if from some very swift sea, let us suffer ourselves to be drawn into too much familiarity, and let us be blessed with great fortune. Among the obedience of fortune, not sufficiently cautious mortality. He who continues to devour fortune with an ear, must swallow the same evil. And in them, let us take a soft approach to the fun, moved a little more vehemently, you do not decide to interrupt before your anger gradually subsides. To persuade the prince that it is necessary is a lot of work, he said. In both cases, as far as possible, from all reports, and let us abstain from calumnies even of a lighter nature, by which the ignorant are led, and by which the more unwary are deceived, openly praised. Who will bring him down, this self-inflicted, when these things are seen, they indicate danger, evil and evil. He who is not able to equal himself, strives to make himself equal by depressing him as much as is in him. It is too hateful to give birth to another's infamy from which any glory may be received. Tacitus writes, Cianus, whose unfortunate end was known to all, was bold in concealing himself, and inciting others. It is also to be done in every conversation, that, not having been asked by the prince, unless you close the conversation on a great cause, and then speak sparingly of the very thing about which you have been asked, and your faces and manners indicate a certain reverence towards him, nay, worship and flattery on this side. Repentantly, those who are given to superiors by superiors, he who spits against Olympus, spits on himself. To these I add some things which are often foolish, or passionate. The prince said, to be carried with an equal mind, 
the old acquaintance of that one, even if you are unable to correct it. However, it should be intended as a mockery, as he in the comic, I will not drink your commandments together with wine. Instead of prudence it is to yield or succumb, for in these things victory often brings ruin. Then Forinus argued, when a certain word of his was rebuked by the Emperor Adrian I, and he had left when his friends were arguing that he should give way to Caesar, because of a word which had been used by competent authors, he caused a most agreeable laugh. Not rightly, he said, be advised, relatives, who do not suffer me to believe that he is more learned than all, who has thirty legions. The fruit of the office is lost, where it is no more than a medicine for him, whose salvation is hopeless, the precepts of wisdom are brought to those who oppose the admonishing precept, let their ears be closed. Nor did Callisthenes follow any other course than that which Aristotle had foretold. Who used to say that he had permission to curse, about which he did not feel very well, since it would be incomparable to either remove or amend them, which would disapprove, not at all worthy of the philosophy person and dignity. Therefore the wisest Thrace, he restrained his son-in-law, the rustic Arilinus, the tribune of the people, lest, says Tacitus, vain, and of no benefit to the defendant, he should begin a disastrous course in the third. Do not foolishly attempt to swim against the Rhone, don't rush against the tide at random, a tumult of noises to cry out against the sea, on the contrary of all, Cyrenus receives and produces rage. These things are therefore said by me, not the ability to speak freely with princes, how often nothing is in the inmost necessary for a mage, for Plinius, most righteously, says, faith, in the present, which it resists, offends, then they themselves are suspected and praised, but circumcised. Nor are these things said to the elders, for a long time and much in the senate you have engaged the princes, whom Papinian liberty deserves, but for you Asperso the first downy evils, liberty, said Valerius Maximus, with a strong spirit, as evidenced both by what he said and what he did, that I would not invite him, so I would not exclude the coming which is placed between virtue and vice if he has controlled himself in a healthy way, praise if he pours out where he ought not, he deserves censure. It sometimes happens that magnates attack a minister with the intention of tempting them, by inciting, for example, a dishonorable veil, or an unjust appearance of righteousness, and by various other arts. Here is what, lest we be caught, but the disciples are to be carefully guarded, but these are discovered without difficulty, if you hear what is being asked, wash your ears with vinegar, and compare with the nature of the questioner, look behavior also, genius, finally, the consequences of things and events, Priscillus the mathematician, when asked by Tiberius Caesar, what year and what day did he have? Not so much from the position of the stars, as from the exposure of the rocks, to which he insisted, by sticking to the idea first, then growing stronger, at last he cried out, doubtful to himself, and approaching the last crisis, he escaped the crisis. If Asinius the Gaul had observed when Tiberius, pretending, had said in the Senate, that he had not entirely returned. It seems that, in this way, whatever part was demanded of him, he would by no means have answered that he would undertake his protection, I ask Caesar what part of the Republic, would you like to order? What a careless answer, not long after man's destruction, however, judging by the look on his face, he brought the matter from the grave. When he was young, he went abroad from Octavius Augustus, whom he referred to by the features of his mouth, when questioned, is it the mother of Rome itself that she will be? Not so much from the speech as from the countenance of Augustus, he detected the stake, therefore his mother had never been there, I asked my father very often, and he answered very kindly. Pomponius was still speaking, when the prefect was returning from the forest, to whom he should extend his arms by number, and a rabbit hangs on each shoulder. He came with the news that my guide was at the door, who would cause me my case, and that he would desire an interview. Returning to the old man, I called to him, my father from dinner, I entered the horse, because I miss you, but still full of good hope, that, as it were, the day after tomorrow, we should return to the same seats, and let us cover the rest of the Palatine's necessities. Tomorrow we will go on a great journey, I am afraid. To which he nods humanely, after having made some spaces, 
We were called to dinner and proceeded, for Aureus, in the meantime, was flying over the middle of the orb, Phoebus. Thus, after we had not only cared for the bodies with food, but also with various things, we had relaxed our minds with advice, I to the praetor, we left for the afternoon saddles. Finis. Description of the silence of the heaven by the author. I had perhaps sat idle in the enchantment of inhabitants' fortune, amused, images and pictorial elegance, which were expressly seen in that wonderful artifice. However, I had turned my eyes to the right, he presented himself with a panel colored by the admirable skill of the artist. This is a precipitous and shattering mountain, the top of which is level and flowery, adorned with many women, he holds a gold badge. Nor is there an open access to it. Such is the inhumanity of the slaves. Two others assisted the matron, not quite equal to this one, but not dissimilar in manner, with a thousand eyes, a green look, and inexhaustible strength. Then the other one unfolded the twisted and multi-stranded chain, the other folded the sewn petals, shining with a square stone. But the great-grandfather of mortals aspired incoherently to the royal woman with a stream of breath, and many more boldly than wisely relied on their own strength to rely on the sublime. But the old man was frustrated when he went out. For that was the difficulty of the place, for most of them, in their own auspiciousness, rushed headlong after long labors, to a few, and indeed to these born of Jove, the help of the great god was given to guide the superiors to the winds. But that god was all-eyed. He was really surprised that I never looked at his face. And it seemed to me absolutely such as the Greeks call firm morals. To him, those excellent men made sacred, don't burn not a victim, but little birds than the Greeks, cut out their thrush on whose altar was inscribed, faith in fate, but as long as it was made sacred, they constantly supported their tongues. But if these had finished praying to the sacred place, that matron, who was unrolling the chains, let down the strap at the end of which a stone had been pierced for which it belonged to. While standing still the god was inserted into the mouth of the supplicant, constricting them, they pursed their lips. He slowly dragged the tall woman up the mountain that if by chance they had resigned their lips, O oh unfortunate men, to whom imminent downfall threatened, and whatever they had pumped up on the way there was lost. But if by better fortune they had reached it, then at last he was girded with a crown, and with great applause and the cup which the royal wife held out, they drank, perpetuum for ages henceforth they demanded a free cure, and with great happiness. As I was studying this picture more diligently, behold, a servant approaching me, says the guest, it is not a thing unworthy of observation, which you see. In truth, don't worry about the novelty of the matter, take the whole picture series. You will see a woman in royal dress sitting on a golden seat on the top of a mountain. She says that fortune is better, than the Greeks, we sometimes greet a good genie, sometimes a goddess, and sometimes even call felicity. But of the two mentors that unfolds the chains is phrenesis, we call prudence. The other pistis, to crush, that is, the invincible faith, which is in no way inferior to happiness, for they are of the same kind as the gods. And if we were willing to confess the truths, unless these were there, it would be sought in vain, but many insist upon it. Why is it any wonder that all men seek salvation? But who could do this without these two, no one has yet been found, he is the one whom the Egyptians call Apocrates, the Greeks Sigalian, ours Silentius. And do not, believe me, until he has appealed to him, the way to salvation will be open. For to whom has little been explored, in human silence there is nothing more wholesome, nothing even more desirable. Is there nothing more shameful, nothing more dangerous than eloquence? Pindarus, praising Epaminondas, said that it was not easy to find another who knew more or spoke less. Nature also openly indicates this, by assigning to us two ears and one tongue, who, says the comedian, ought to hear more than to speak. For they say that Amyclus perished in silence, but that he was destroyed by the serpents. But I think that it was due to the carelessness of the guard that Xenocrates ordered it to be more pious rather than athletes to put fireballs to the ears of children, lest, hearing the lost men, he should control their madness. 
Bias Prenius, once ordered by Amasides the Egyptian, to send the best and most terrifying part of his victims to himself, chose his language. Yea, and the old ones did not kiss the children's mouths, but their ears, as if they were more advanced in this part than in that. Hence the index finger is called the salutary finger, because with it the salutary thing of silence is indicated to mortals. And the night is said among the Greeks, that through the silence of the night everyone becomes wiser. When Alexander had put Darius to flight in one battle, which country he sought with every care, he was not able to explore, after the manner of a certain Persian, the secret secret of the kings was hidden from the side, neither fear nor hope excites, by which secrets are betrayed. The ancient discipline of silent kings sanctioned the danger of life, and the tongue is more chaste than any reproach. Nor can they endure a great rebuke from him, to whom it is ignoble to be silent, which nature has willed to be the easiest for man. It is indeed so, as the Greeks say, that nothing is better than silence. That is, he led many to destruction with his tongue. For how many men put their words back down their throats? What did Staterius destroy the Roman man, what did Pausanias the Lacedaemonian lose but the lust of chattering? What did he do against Lena, the otherwise infamous harlot? How would the Athenians publicly present themselves with his symbol, namely the tongue of a lioness, without a yoke of silence? What is the victory of Hercules against the Trojans? Silence indeed. Whence the promontory of Sigius is still celebrated. Pythagoras, who was certainly aware of the usefulness of this, proposed that before all learning he wanted his pupils to learn to speak, to them a state of silence, which he called hence the mystery of the expulsion of the swallow, that the chatterers are far from being eliminated, although he wished to be understood as exploding temporary friends. There is a famous verse of the Greeks, extract the talking vagrant's tongues from the house. Being asked what philosophy had profited him, he answered, that I would and could be silent. Nature verily fenced our tongue with lips and teeth, as Homer said, lest the words which he called irrevocable should easily slip out of our mouths. Plautus, the poet, would show that silence should be indicated by silence, a comment is an image of a voice without a vowel with two consonants, Saint Appius, who was blind because of the violation of the sacred servitudes of Herculaneum, was seized with his eyes. The ancient Romans were aware of how much eloquence they did not want the secret word to be divulged, so that, having found the name of the words, the enemies may invoke the gods, which Valerius Sorinus dared to declare, he was soon punished. This is what we say, in our sacred languages. For prayer must not be born in the tongue, but in the heart. Hence the image of Angerona, bound and sealed, as an example of ancient religion, instituted for this very reason of silence, to which he is sacrificed on the 12th of January. For the same reason the altar of Athena was worshipped, which they had dedicated to the unknown gods. This is what he said to be silent about the good, because it feeds the tongue. The sayings of the ancients came out against the chatter of six hundred. Thus Homer, the interpreter of truth, desiring to discredit their Zetons the most, said of him, that is to say, that he was spewing immoderate words. Hence the Greeks say that the extremity of the tip of the tongue is pierced for all talkers, hence the genus Blatterones, that is, the more talkative turtles. And there is no chatter that is not hateful, and that is to say a Dodonian cauldron, when at Dodona a brazen boy, driven by the wind, beats twelve cauldrons at the same time. Well, well, I say, Melissius Mycenaeus imposed a three-year silence on himself. He said no less wisely, a fool also, if he keeps silent, will be considered wise. And everyone is wise in silence. And that of Pythagoras is brought about, that is, every one, even an ignorant one, will be wise if he remains silent. He, too, when some more private things were requested, said, would I put a coat on if I thought she was aware of my things? As he asked another. When was he going to move the camp, or did you not listen to the classic answer? So great was the religion of silence. When Xenocrates was asked why he was silent, he replied that he sometimes regretted having spoken, but never remained silent. This, in the first place, he educated his children as Laconians, 
whom they called Bomonix. From here to beatings, from here all the pains were constantly endured. He, when the fox had stolen him by stealth, and had lashed him firmly to the ground, endured the pains more obstinately. He had also written on the forge of the Triclinians, let not a word go forth from here. Therefore that distinguished signifier, who painted a god, covered himself with a cap in laconic fashion, that you should so interpret, and whatever things were entrusted to you more confidentially, should be hidden. Or that it is in the discretion of each one to keep silent by the generosity of his nature, I am sure that speaking is not equally free, or that chattering is a vice of serfdom with respect to honest silence. For sycophants and flatterers, as well as women, especially suffer from this disease. Of which Plotinus expounded, that nothing was found to have been changed in all ages, and, women's furniture is a cry. But the slanderers do not keep silent, but heap up their promiscuous discourses, while in the ears of the hearers these imaginary praises are filled by these foreign marriages. Here and there no one is curious but talkative. There is also an adage about those who spare a new word, that is, the wolf was first seen, which causes hoarseness and difficulty in speaking when he first examines it. This is why you see a god covered with a wolf's cloak. For this kind of animal, when it hunts not even to these, as the others are wont to indicate joy by a cry, which the storyteller Aesop rehearsed in a beautiful example. They commonly ascribe to the gods the weak feet, so that they proceed slowly and without noise to avenge the injuries of the wicked, in which example, the painter brought the shoes to the god. It is also usually said of the prudent, that is, foxes do not chatter. For those who are prudent carefully look around, listen and investigate everything. And let them strictly observe this, lest they should speak of anything other than the matter or of little advantage. On the contrary, the others object to it, that is, either say that it is better to be silent, or keep your voice. It is not surprising therefore, if a god is depicted as all-eyed, all-eared. Jove was made to be sacred, for ancient times thought that all the greatest men were born of Jove. Hence Jove was at the top of the race, that is, Jove had dignity that is, greet the heralds of Louis the messenger, when he spoke of Tilthebius and Eribatis. And that is the one to whom Jupiter gave his condescension. Hence Jupiter is said to be the father of men, after all, and such excellent men, that is, Homo calls them jovially born. And, as Orpheus says, let us confess the truth that is from Jove, all good things are brought forth. Plato also thought that he was aware of divine things. And let them sacrifice the thrush, since it is an animal favored by silence, namely, that he abstain from chattering. Of whom Eubulus made a proverb, that is, the more silent thrush. For those who chatter are least thought to be thrushes, like and that is the cicada hiding inside a tub, and the frog and in Plato the tadpole frog is thought to be dumb and it becomes sacred at the altar to which it is titled. Have faith! For we worship the Silent One, not with him, who is born of admiration from which they say that the system of philosophizing arose. But that most beautiful and the greatest and most desirable of all, and princes, whom the faith found unencumbered, and presided over the mysteries of Eustodii. This is he to whom, after the people have pity, an obsidian stone of the blackest color is given to them. Which Obsidius brought from Ethiopia, he stuffs into his mouth. Whose power is the consent of all the magi, that he renders men dumb and utterly speechless. And since it is possible to reach happiness, silence alone is not enough. Prudence, approaching them, draws them with a chain, a chain, as I say, commensurate with the number of virtues. For the virtues hold each other in connection with each other and follow each other, like that manifold or series of none. Which Plato wrote to be drawn by a magnet. In this way also that circle of knowledge is carried, which the Greeks called the Cyclopedia. But if some evil should happen to them, that they should resign their mouths, at once a dangerous accident looms. For it is not enough that you have begun, that you have begun well. But if things happen to those who are well-wishers, faith is available, which repays the reward of labors, and surrounded by immortal wreaths.
he leads the Saviour to the throne of the Goddess. She offered him a cup of Nepenthes, such as Telemachus shook off all his cares, and in the future you will live a happy life of peace and prosperity. So he explained to me the picture we bought. But I, thinking to myself, observed that nothing was more agreeable or desirable to men than to silence. Hence I recognized the Panathenaic Pallades and Erictonius, and the Canifers and Chests, hence the Corybantus Forest hence the Narthicophors of Liberi, and the Thyasos Convoluted, hence the Carbasons of the Egyptians who were said that they should impart to no one the secrets of religion. Hence the hieroglyphic images, hence the Coptic systems and ramparts, hence the veiled and secluded of Isis, hence the entry into which there is nothing more religious among the priests of the Gauls, hence the fables of the philosophic forum, and that incomprehensible Proteus hence Plato's still unexplained numbers, hence the Samothracian Cabirus, the four Osiris, Axiosus, Axiosus, and Casimilan, whom some interpret as Seers, Persephone, and Pluto. For Dionysodorus considered Casmalus to be Mercury. And if they thought of only two others, Lu the Elder, and Dionysus the Younger. Hence the horns of Mithras, hence the secrets of the good goddess. Hence I despised the sacred prayers of the gods to the oracle. Hence the dog in the sack, hence the oaths of the Essenes, hence the very name of the mysteries, where necessary, that is, to seal the mouth. Thus kings test those whom they wish to win into a more penitent friendship. In this way Numenius contracted the trouble that he had performed the Eleusinian ceremonies. Thus Telemachus admonishes Ulysses in Homer, that is, shut up and press your mind, never to speak. Thus, he says, is the exclamation of the barbarians, the silence of the Greeks. On this account the tragic poet Theodotus, when he had attempted to translate some of the books of the Hebrews into a fable, suddenly caught his eye. For the same reason, Theopompus, struck with panic and confusion of mind, could hardly ask for forgiveness. Nay, indeed, some of the wisest men set in silence the highest good, do not forget the saying of the old admonisher, that we should then make words, as either the silence will be harmful or the words will be beneficial to us. For surely it is so, as Hesiod said. That is, the treasure of language is the best thing for a man, as long as it is hidden, that is, that nothing should be too much, and that everything should be laid down in time. From which a prudent man will easily measure the turns of speech and silence. For, happy or without the eel of the druids, anyone who has the opportunity to do so will understand. When it was due to be done, he wished to be silent, I would, when it was fitting to be silent, be done, there are two things that human beings must beware of, private evils and public affairs. But of these evil too, better than what could he speak in silence, it was not fitting to speak to the speaker, for there are many things by which they reveal many things by keeping silent, and many things could easily be said, which are to be kept silent in their times. Therefore, either learn to be silent about chattering, or exile the whole world once. Farewell. O oh, tongue, tongue, you need great guarding. Why and where often, and more often you harm the master. He who has achieved much, who has learned to speak well. He who is good at keeping silent has achieved no less. M. A. M.